Shabbat Shalom to everyone and welcome to Wisdom and Torah Ministries. I am um, sharing uh, the Torah portion this week. I was supposed to do chapter 19 of the book of Acts and we'll record that. And I will post it on the Telegram chat for uh, the study of the way um, on Telegram. If you want to be part of that study group, please send me a text or an email or whatever. And then I'll send you the link to, uh, to the uh, study group that I have a private group on Facebook only for those people who really want to learn and just they're focusing on trying to share information and uh, uh, allow me to share what I'm learning. If you really want to debate or have your own conversations, it's not the place for you. It's not about a debate room. It's basically a learning platform, a safe space where we can just put posts and I can post stuff that would actually try to help edify the kingdom. And uh, I just want to have a little piece, at least on Facebook, in the, high, in the hidden room that we can all agree on on just study and search and find and validate information. All right, so this week's Torah portion is Shemini. We're going to focus on this particular portion. Uh, portion. And, you know, this this week I was studying for this on Wednesday for my Spanish class, and I presented it as a thesis. Now, remember, I've been studying the temple now for a long time, over 25 years, and I've been really focusing on that deeper into the temple for 15 with Joseph Good, my teacher. And... um. I've understood a lot of the things from the offerings and the whole controversy with the whole red heifer has really provoked me to go back and validate information, look for more information and keep searching and looking and reviewing the rituals, the requirements, uh, the, the halakha or the rulings in regards to the paraduma, the red heifer. Um, it's clear to me, those of us like Joe and I and the group that studies like Kyle, he's here, um, that many people who are commenting on Facebook as well as YouTube, they have no idea about what the thing is all about. And I find it very interesting how the people commenting and many of the people who are, that everyone is following, they don't study the temple. They're doing it because it's the thing to do and they want to get, you know, some kind of tr traction. It's interesting that no one cares about the temple until the red effort comes over. And then the audience goes, listens to people who don't really study the topic. And you can read it in the Bible, Numbers 19, yes. But the Bible doesn't give you all the information, in this case, about the ritual taking place in the temple because it's not designed to give you every ritual in the in Numbers 19. You know, that was given and regulated to the priests and the, and the Kohenim. And therefore, we need to understand that there are things that are complementary, in this case, to understanding the temple service, that it validates the Bible, obviously, because Scripture is always above everything else. So this week's Torah portion was very peculiar to me. Uh, it's actually the portion when I was born in 1966. The week that I was born, this was the Torah portion that was being read. Um, and it's, it's interesting because it's, it's a dear, uh, for me, it's very dear uh, Torah portion. Uh, I consider it very personal. <laughs> Reviewing this Torah portion, please understand that I've been reading it and reading it. Reading it because it's my favorite Torah portion. I never caught on to something as much as I did this time around. Now, I've read it many times, but I never really consider it, consider the implications that it had in regards to the book of Hebrews. And that's what I want to present to you. I'm going to present it to you as a thesis. This actually has been validated by a few other books that I have. This one that is written by Roy Gain, Colton Character. Also by Jacob Milgram. Uh, it's called Leviticus. Uh, the Jacob Milgram is by far one of the biggest scholars of the book of Leviticus. Spent 35, almost 40 years studying that book alone. So he's known as in the scholarly world as one of the premier authorities on the book of Leviticus. So I begin to look into this particular verse and I'm going to go right into the text. We have a lot of information. So I really want to give you as best as I can. Remember. It's a thesis. We are presenting it as a thesis because when I taught it on Wednesday, I did a pretty decent job with the information that I had to introduce it. Today, I'm going to repeat the teaching and add more of the information that I found. So when it comes to the temple service, especially the, uh, the offerings, many people are using the book of, uh, of Hebrews to disregard the temple service, to disregard the offerings in the millennial reign or the messianic age. Uh, 
the Bible completely refutes that uh, that position. The Bible is clear. And when I hear the arguments against the temple or against the uh, the offering system being restored, their arguments make no sense whatsoever. And it only shows that the person really are not really focusing on the function and the uh, and the uh, and the role of the offerings in the temple service. Guys, I don't mean this to be arrogant, but please understand that certain people are focusing in certain areas. Okay, and I'm trying to share with you some of the areas that myself, Kyle, Joseph Good, and some other people that I study with or I, uh, my students, we focus on these things, and you have to allow yourself to have an open mind to completely adapt every day and every year to the new findings we have. So let me take you to what I've basically realized. Now, about 10 years ago, I was reading an article on ancient Near Eastern uh, covenants, culture, and rituals. When I got to the Egyptian rituals, as well as some of the other ones in regards to, uh, there's a book, by the way, by, man, I forgot his name. Um, the book is right over there, I think. If only I can remember where it is. It's actually a really good scholar. It's about the Khatat, and he's comparing the sin or the uh, guilt uh, offering, the purification offering in this case, the purification. Khatat can mean a, a, um, a particular transgression against a prohibited commandment or a uh, purification offering. So really it's a purification offering. You translate it as a sin, but in reality, it means purification because the temple gets defiled when you sin. Okay, that's the way it was done in, in the book of uh, in the book of Exodus, when Moses uh, uh, sprinkles the people and then he sprinkles the altar. It creates an indexing. So from that moment, when the people of Israel sin, it, auto it automatically defiles the altar. And then book of Leviticus chapter sixteen in Exodus talks about that when Moses sprinkled the blood on the people on the altar. And Leviticus tells us, 16, that the um, on the Day of Atonement, it brings atonement for, you know, from, atonement from the defilement, impurities of the people. The people sin, it defiles by default. Individually, they do it. On the Day of Atonement, it's a basically, um, it's trying to do away with the whole Bring in atonement for the national sin, for the different types of sins. And that's what we're going to be talking about based on Leviticus chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. Okay, so when we read Leviticus chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, it reads like this. And I want to really, I'm going to ask a very important question. Now, before I read the question, I want to, I want to make this statement. The reason why I'm making this study is because... People keep saying that I don't believe in Yeshua. I went to Canada, and there people were saying, a few people came after me uh, after my teaching, that they've heard that I don't believe in Yeshua. That's a lie, guys. It's ridiculous. Anyone who knows my ministry knows that I've always been a believer in Yeshua. Not only would I confess that in front of every Christian, every Hebrew Ruth, and every Messianic, but I've actually done it in front of Orthodox when it really matters, you know, and defend my position about my faith in Messiah, as Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua, as the Messiah, in front of people in Israel. Now, they don't accept it, but that's fine. But I could do it over there. You know, please stop. Just because I'm studying uh, certain things, and I uh, uh, and I study the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, and I understand the sacrificial system, and I do believe that will be restored in the Messianic era, doesn't mean that I don't believe in Yeshua. That only shows the lack of understanding you have on the temple. And I will prove that to you today in this stuff. So please ask me. You know, and you don't even ask anymore. You have to know by listening to my teachings what I believe. Because slandering doesn't help anybody. I don't think, you know, it's not it's not right. You know? And uh, we have to, if you don't know the topic, just learn it first. Don't automatically assume something about somebody if you do not know the topic. And that happens a lot. And it's truly sad and uh, that this is going on when it's not true. You know, people don't, some of them don't listen to me because they heard somebody say, hey, he don't believe in Yeshua. That's a lie, you know? And I want to challenge anybody to tell me when did I say ever that I don't believe in Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel, okay? All right, with that being said, let's get into the teaching. Because if you believe in Yeshua, as you all think you do, 
and you're slandering somebody who actually does believe in Yeshua and can prove why he believes in Yeshua, then you must bring your thesis as to why you believe in Yeshua. And I'm going to prove you the point right now. Watch this. I'm going to ask the question. Now, with that being said, I believe Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. I believe Yeshua is the image of the invisible Elohim. I believe Yeshua is pre-existent. I believe Yeshua is the Redeemer. I believe Yeshua sits at the right hand of the Father. Now, if you don't agree with me, that's fine, but that's what I believe. Now, let me ask you this question. I'm going to read these verses, okay? Now, I'll put you on the spot. Because if you believe in Yeshua, then you must explain this verse. And I don't mean to be challenging, but when my, the, the integrity and the character of what I represent is being challenged, I think I owe, it, I owe it to myself to defend the integrity, not only of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, but also his son, Yeshua, who came to be so we can be restored to his image. Okay? So now, let me ask you this. I'm going to read the verse. And then I will ask you the question. And then you must prove your point as to why you believe in Yeshua. Watch this. Then Moses sought all over, for, uh, all over for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burnt up. This is when the sons of Aaron got killed because of strange fire. We've always covered that, chapter 9 and 10. Then in chapter 10, uh, they bring an offering to the, to the altar, to the temple, uh, to the uh, tabernacle. And then... The sons of Aaron, Eliezer and Itamar, did not eat it. Watch, it says this. Then Moses sought all over for the goat of the sin offering, and behold, it was burned up. So he was angry with Aaron, Aaron's remaining sons, Eliezer and Itamar, saying, now pay attention. Why do you not eat the sin offering? By the way, the word sin here is the Hebrew word avon. I'm sorry, chatat, I apologize. It's the word chatat. Expiation, sin offering, or, or purification, or penalty, okay, things like that. Now it says, the sin offering on the sanctuary site, because it is most holy thing, and he gave it to you. Now listen to what Moses is telling Aaron about his sons. He gave it to you to remove the community's guilt. The word there is avon. The word guilt, watch, is the word avon. Avon, which means misdeed, sin, guilt caused by sin, punishment. So now we got this strange, very interesting question. It says, and he gave it to you to remove the community's guilt, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Look, his blood was not brought inside the sanctuary. Certainly you should have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. So Aaron said to Moses, look, today they presented their sin offering and their burnt offerings before the Lord and such things and things such as these happened to me. In other words, the death of his sons. And if I were to eat sin offerings today, would have been good in the Lord's eyes? When Moses heard it, it was good in his eyes. Let me, let me explain the last part and then challenge you with verse 16 and 17. The last part is because in the ancient Near East, they used to worship the underworld gods. Okay. Okay. Uh, if not, they used to worship the underworld gods. Okay. So now what happens is that if he would have eaten that offering right there after his sons died, and remember the sons died in the tabernacle proper, then it would have given the impression that they are eating sacrifices to the underworld gods. Very important. So that's why when Aaron gave he was in complete mourning but when he gave and he was not celebrate uh, not celebrating but uh showing the signs of mourning in the tabernacle because you are not allowed it's against torah to do anything in connection with mourning in the temple or the altar or the tabernacle please understand that so after moses heard his explanation then he says okay i get it so but that doesn't still mean that the priest at one point or another needed to eat of the korbanot the offerings and I try not to use the word sacrifice because the word sacrifice is wrongly in tra uh, translated. It should be offerings. The word sacrifice is a Latin, comes from the Latin word, word to consecrate. But unfortunately, in the Western world, the word sacrifice is always connected with death. Okay? So that's not the context in the Hebrew. The word korban means to draw near. Now, what's interesting, and this is the question to you, verse 17. Why did you not eat, eat the sin offering? on the sanctuary site, because it is most holy thing. And he gave it to you to remove the community's guilt, that word avon or pollution, 
to make atonement for them before the Lord. Now, let me ask you the question. Now. Okay. If that's the case, and I already said before I say that, uh, before I ask this question, I already said I believe in perfect faith that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. Okay. But based on that verse, you need to explain to me, then why do you need Yeshua as Messiah if they already had atonement in the temple? This is the reason why there are certain people come around, they start teaching you certain things, or you talk to the Orthodox, and if you're not equipped to talk about the temple service, then they'll tell you certain things, and they'll point you out to Leviticus 4 and Leviticus 5, and in this case, Leviticus 10, and then you say, wow, there was atonement? So what do we need Jesus for? And then people go running to the religion, okay? So now, if you believe in Yeshua, you must answer this question. You know, what do we need Yeshua for? Obviously, there was atonement. Okay, so clearly we do need Messiah. Because the Torah cannot do certain things for you. Specifically one. It cannot provide eternal life. Or life. It can point out sin. It can restore a relationship with the Lord. Because the Torah was not designed to provide eternal life. Let me prove it to you. Okay? When you go, um, please allow me to, uh, to state my case before you're commenting on things that you haven't heard yet. Okay, so it will be just out of respect. I would really appreciate it if you allow me to do that. So let's go to the book of the book of book of Acts, chapter thirteen. It's really interesting because then when you read from verse thirty, right here, verse thirty forward, it says, "But God raised him from the dead." That's God raising up Yeshua who appeared for many days to those who have come up uh, with him from the Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. We proclaim the good news to you, that the promise that was made to the fathers, the promise, which is resurrection, by the way, God fulfilled to our children by raising Yeshua. It is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have fathered you. Verse 34, but that he has raised him from the dead, no more going to re, uh, no no more going to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the reliable divine decrees of David. Therefore, he is also said in another psalm: "You will not permit your holy one to experience decay." For David, I want you to pay attention. This is very important. Verse thirty-six, seven, and eight is going to outline for you what the Torah cannot do for you. Okay. And by the way, the Book of Romans tells you the same thing. If you read chapter 5, it tells you. Watch, it says, And David, after serving the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and experienced decay. Meaning, he died and he did not resurrect. David did not resurrect. But he whom God raised up, Yeshua, did not experience decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brothers, that, uh, that through this one, Yeshua, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. Now, the word forgiveness, I've, I've spoken on this a lot. It's offices. It's actually a jubilee, a freedom, liberty, okay? It says, of sins is proclaimed to you. This is the part right here. This is the part right here, okay? It says, and from all the things from which you were not able to be justified by the law of Moses. Moses was a good man, the, mo the most humble man on earth at that time. He died. Then you have the prophets. They died. The kings that were righteous ones, they died. The prophets, they died. The whole hall of fame of the dead in the book of uh, Hebrew, chapter, chapter 12, or chapter 11. I can't remember what chapter it is. And it's talking about the hope. That hope is resurrection. The Torah cannot justify anybody to do away with sin. I'm sorry, with death. Let me repeat this again. The Torah was not designed to do away with death. No sacrifices in the temple can eliminate death forever. They could restore your relationship with God annually as a nation, individually in the personal offerings. But you could not, as many sacrifices you will bring to the offering, uh, the offering that you will bring to the temple at the time, and the second temple, first temple, and the tabernacle. It didn't matter. How many offerings you brought, how righteous you were, how blameless you were, you will die. And that is caused by what Adam did in the garden. 
That's the premise of what Paul is writing in Romans chapter 1 through chapter 9. He's really doing a great job explaining this. Now, so the Torah cannot justify you in regards to death. That's why you needed a special forgiveness, a pardon. I already explained to you that in the Torah, in Leviticus chapter 1 through chapter 10, we know that there was atonement. Chapter 16, the annual, uh, cele uh, not celebration, but the uh, ritual uh, of Yom HaKippurim. It was done to bring atonement. So there was forgiveness for sins, but there was no forgiveness for willful rebellion, and there's no sacrifice for that. So therefore, only God can render a pardon, a pardon. That's what we're talking about, not the regular forgiveness. We're talking about the pardon that only the king can give, and that's what we're going to explain today. Okay, I got to go leave right away to go teach in Spanish, but I'm hoping I can really establish a good premise on this, okay? So I'm going to show you why I believe in Yeshua and why I believe he's the Messiah of Israel. Okay, so now let me go here to Romans chapter 5. I think it's chapter 5. Juan, si tú lo citaste, si ponme la cita te lo agradezco. Let me see if um, he's helping me out with a quote here real quick. Okay, so in Romans, I can't remember. Juan, si me puedo ayudar con eso. Okay, I'm trying to remember that verse. Listen to what Romans chapter 5 actually tells us in verse 12. Because of this, just as sin entered into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, through sin, so also death spread to all people because all sin. But until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not charged to one's account when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, but even over those who did not sin in the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who is to come. Messiah, right? Then in verse 17, we're going to get there. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the trespass of the one, the many died, by much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Yeshua, Messiah, multiply to the many. And the gift is not through the one who sinned, but on the, on the one hand, judgment from the one sin led to condemnation. But the gift, I mean salvation, um, from many trespasses led to justification. For if, watch this, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the, new, the, the one man, much more were those who received the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one, Yeshua the Messiah. Consequently, therefore, as though, as through one trespass came condemnation to all people, so also through one righteous deed came justification of life to all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one, Yeshua, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in, uh, in the law came in as a side issue, in order that the trespass could increase, but where sin increased, grace was present in greater abundance. You see? It's clear. So just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness to eternal life. So now righteousness uh, of God means eternal life. It's a gift of God through Yeshua, the Messiah, our Lord. Okay? So now, what, so what's interesting is when you go into the understanding of the Bible, okay, and you know really the purpose of Yeshua's uh, um, coming death and resurrection, just like Romans chapter 8 says, consequently, there is no condemnation for those who are in Yeshua the Messiah, for the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set you free from the law of sin and death. So let me get this straight. The offerings in the temple 
could not do away with what Yeshua's purpose, role, and uh, message was, that God would defeat death forever, just like the prophecy in Isaiah 25, 8. So that's, that's, this is the reason why in the New Testament, you see Yeshua never mentioned anything against the offerings, against the priesthood, against the temple itself. He talked about the corruption in the temple by the people, but not the service itself, because he knew the service was holy. The office is holy. The disciples all went to the temple. Paul did a Nazarite vow. Peter and John went up to pray at the hour of prayer. We have the evidence that in the first 40 years of the uh, uh, of the of the first century, uh, after Yeshua died and resurrected, the temple was still functioning and the offerings will still be taken. And not one of the disciples spoke anything against the temple, the tithe, the offerings of the temple, the loss of the temple, the priesthood of the temple. None of that stuff is found anywhere in the New Testament until the temple is about to be destroyed. And then you have the writer of the Hebrews presenting his letter of comfort as to how the Lord is going to restore us through the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, not on the heavenly, not on the earthly tabernacle, but the heavenly tabernacle. And verse 3, for what was impossible for the law, listen to this, for what was impossible for the, law, for the law, that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In this context, in the book of Romans, flesh is without Torah, spirit is Torah, for the law is spiritual in chapter 7. So death is the center of attention in the Gospels and also in the message of Paul, in the message of Yeshua, in the message of, the, of everything, in the message of the Gospel. The whole idea here is about resurrection. I already showed you, though, however, that in the Bible there was atonement for sins. But there was no, uh, there was no, um, uh, there was no forgiveness for willful rebellion. So let's go back to all these comments that I have here in chapter sixteen. I want to read one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, thirteen. Little notes that you see right here. These notes are going to explain, based on research that I've done. What I'm trying to convey to you are the importance of the, the reason why the priest needed to eat some of the offerings. Okay? Uh, how many of you did not know that if a priest would eat the offering, it would bring atonement? And it's actually biblical. By the way, if you understand this, if you would understand this, then the whole thing about Passover, eating the lamb, will make sense. Let me ask you all a question. What's more important, the lamb or the blood in the Exodus experience? I want to see your comments. Please give me your comments in the chat and also on Facebook. Okay? What is more important, the blood or the lamb? The blood. So what do we need the lamb for? That's a represent. It was a meal. You have to eat the lamb. What does the lamb represent? And that's in Egypt. You're going to be shocked to find out what the lamb represented. It's actually a goat or a ram. It's all connected. If we understand what the goat and the ram and the sheep represented in Egypt to the Egyptians, then you will know why Joseph told his brothers, hey, don't tell them you're shepherds. And then what did the brothers say to Pharaoh? Hey, we're shepherds. And why we need to eat the lamb for the temple service. If there was a temple, the Korban Pesach, the offering for the Passover has to be a lamb. It represents something. We know Yeshua is a metaphor of a lamb. We know that. It has a meaning. But then check this out. The priest would eat the offerings and it would bring atonement for unwillful, uh, even willful but repentant sin. Somebody did some willful and they repented. There was a way to make restoration and rectify that. But if he did it in rebellion, then there was nothing for you. Anything dealing with moral sin, like idolatry, uh, uh, adultery, that was rebellion because it's covenantal and it deals with moral sin. That's completely different. Anything in rebellion in that aspect, it was cut off. Okay? So 
many things are like that in the Bible. We need to understand the differences. So we need to understand really why the priest needed to eat the offering, certain offerings, they have to eat it in order to bring atonement. And then on the day of atonement, something kind of interesting happens. It's the day of the fast. And all of a sudden, no one is eating anything. By the way, the book of Hebrews is written in the context of the day of atonement. So every sacrifices, all the offerings that are uh, actually alluded to in the book of Hebrews is dealing only with the day of atonement. It's not talking about the daily offerings done any other day of the week or any day of the year. Only the 15 animals, depending on which source you read, maybe 16, uh, that the priests have to buy the animals in order for him to do the offering. And everyone is outside repenting, and no one is bringing any kind of offering at all to the temple on that day. And the, and the whole uh, service and the ritual of Yom Kippur is to atone and to cleanse the altar for all the, from all the abominations uh, uh, that, the, that the children of Israel caused in his temple. Let me read that to you. We go to chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. It says, And he shall slaughter a sin offering, uh, which is for the people, and he shall bring its blood from behind the curtain. That means that's the when you bring the animal, I'm sorry, you bring the blood of that animal into the Holy of Holies. These are burnt outside the camp. Okay, these are not eaten at all. Because the, the sin and the uh, and the pollution that actually the, the altar contained, because that's to bring atonement for the sanctuary, the Holy Holies, the holy place, the altar, and the temple. It's to cleanse it every year from the sins of Israel. Okay, and it says this, watch. It says, and he shall slaughter the sin offering, uh, the, the sin offering's goat, which is for the people. He shall bring it, she shall bring his blood from behind the curtain. And he shall do with his blood as he did with the bull's blood. And he shall spatter it on the atonement cover and before the atonement cover. Thus he shall make atonement for the sanctuary from the Israelites' impurities and from their transgressions. And all of their sins. So he must do for the tent of assembly, which dwells with them in the midst of their impurities. Wait a minute. So there was atonement for people in the Bible. So really, what's the purpose of Yeshua's coming, uh, death, burial, and resurrection? Which I believe he resurrected. And I believe he's the Messiah. You need to ask that question. It's to defeat death. You know, the only time that the uh, that the guilt and the sin of Israel was transferred to an animal was not for the regular daily offerings. It was actually for the scapegoat for Azazel. When the priest, as it says right here in the verse 20, and he shall finish making atonement for the sanctuary and the tent of assembly and the altar for everything. And he shall present the living to the living goat. And Aaron shall place his two hands on the living goat's head and he shall confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and all the transgressions and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head on the goat's head. And he shall send it away into the desert with the men standing ready. Thus the goat shall bear on it to a barren region and all their guilt. And he shall send the goat away into the wilderness. That is what it, well, that's what it means, taking away the sin of the world. And the, and the word that is using here is avon. You see, again, I, I'm, I'm showing this, and I know some of you are going to say, whoa, whoa Rico, that's, you're going too fast. Whoa, whoa, whoa Rico, that, we don't really quite understand it. You know, please slow it down. But why should I slow it down? We keep telling everybody we believe in Yeshua. Then yet we blame all the people that they say they don't believe in Yeshua, and then we can't even handle this information. Guys, I'm being a little bit straightforward with you. Because the time has come, the red heifers are ready, and there are many people within our camp slandering what's going on, speaking bad at what's going on against Israel. They have no idea what these things are for. And we're committing some serious, serious issues of misunderstanding the Bible. And again, I'm not saying I know everything. I'm learning. But I surely focus on this area for a while, so allow me the opportunity to guide you a little bit. Okay? And then if I'm wrong, I'll fix it. It's not a problem. Okay? So... What is the importance of eating the sin offering? Check this out. This will blow you away. Now, I studied this a long time ago, but I lost the resource. And it just, 
I finally found it again at the perfect timing, by the way. The importance of eating the sin offering. It says, the sin or purification offering was believed to absorb impurities that were presented to be remedied. This concept of ritual absorption was common in the ancient Near East. When a large amount was absorbed as on the Day of Atonement, the entire offering was burned to remove the impurity. That's why the animals, the scapegoat for Azazel, and the other animal, the other uh, uh, the other goat that was for the Lord, only the blood was taken to the Holy Holies. The entrails were placed on the altar, and the reason why the entrails were placed on the altar, so that no one would ever say that the God of Israel, uh, that, that, that the priests are doing divination, because they used to read the liver. So therefore, they put the entrails on the altar, and by the way, Kyle, you here? If I'm wrong, please correct that, okay? But then the animal was taken outside the camp. It was burnt outside the camp. Hebrews tells us the same thing. The red heifer's benefit was to allow you, if you had any connection with the dead, then you have to uh, be sprinkled with the waters of purification in order to be able to come into the temple. Because if you had any connection with death, corpse impurity, then you cannot fellowship with God. That's the way it was in the temple. Now, let me read this. The, I already read, that, read this part. But in most cases, the fact that the priests ate the indicated parts played a role in the purification process. Scholars suggest that it symbolized holiness by swallowing impurity. Now, rem just remember this. It's going to make sense. It says, I'm going to explain it, and I'm going to connect it with something that happened in the Passover. It says, they are right in understanding the explanation given here by Aaron to Moses as reflecting his fear for caution. The presence of a corpse on the children's, uh, on his children in the sanctuary area may have greatly increased the amount of impurity absorbed by the purification offering, making it lethal for the priests. And as an aid to readers not familiar with certain terms, that comes up repeatedly. We have included a glossary of the end of the book in regards to this. Now, this is just one note on this. Let me let me share the other one here. I'm going to find it because I think the reason why you eat it. Why do they have to eat it? That's important. Right, this is the one. Now, check this out. This is by Jacob Milgram. Okay, now this is a very important commentary because this guy is a Jewish guy who studied the book of Hebrews for like, I'm sorry, the book of Leviticus for years. I'm talking about over 30. Okay, it says, listen to what he says in regards to the priest eating the offerings. Now, I'm going to show you how significant this is because Yeshua says something related to this stuff. Watch. It says, it is precisely because the purification offering is associated with impurity that is ingestion by the priest becomes so crucial. The priest is the personification of holiness. The purification offering is the embodiment of impurity. In the priestly symbolic system, the holiness code, holiness stands for life, whereas Impurity stands for death. Oh, wait a minute. Did you catch it? I need you guys, I need you guys to, to answer here. Did you catch that? Impurity represents death, and the holiness of the priest represents life. This is the reason why the writer of Hebrews is presenting Yeshua as a high priest when nowhere in the New Testament ever talks about Yeshua as a high priest. It has a very significant meaning. Because the priest will bear the guilt of the people. And I'll show you that in a minute. Give me time. Okay, watch. Let me repeat this part again. In the priestly symbolic system, the holiness code stands, a holiness stands for life, whereas impurity stands for death. When the priest consumes the purification offering, he is making a profound theological statement. Holiness has swallowed impurity, life, can defeat death. Folks, this is the reason why I believe Yeshua is the Messiah. I'm going to read this paragraph, and then I'm going to read you the verses. So it's about defeating death. The priests, that's why we are a nation of priests, not in the order of Melchizedek. We are a nation of priests. The symbolism saying that because we are eating Passover every year, 
when we are eating, we cannot have the lamb, clearly, because the Korban Pesach can only be in, in Jerusalem within the city walls. But the bread, the matzah, represents now that. When we are having that meal, we are celebrating the victory over death. You know how I caught on to this? Because as I follow the Torah and I follow the uh, the halakha, so many rulings that are biblical, when we break down the sukkah, there's a prayer. May it be your will, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, that next year we build our sukkah with the skins of Leviathan. Leviathan is Belial, according to the Qumran community. Uh, Leviathan is the dragon, it's a serpent. It's all these things, Ra Rahab, Ra'av, all these things represent the serpent, the devil, which is seeking to destroy and bring death. So that means that tabernacles is the celebration of the restoration of the kingdom to life because death has been defeated. Let me read the, the paragraph. When the priest consumes the purification offering, he is making a profound theological statement. Holiness has swallowed impurity. Life can defeat death. Interesting. Didn't Yeshua say in the book of Matthew, hey, this is my flesh. The bread, he lifts up the bread. He says, this is my flesh. Eat. Twelve people. The uh, twelve tribes of Israel. This symbolism carries through all the rites with a purification offering. The priest is unaffected by the daubing blood on the altar, though the blood is absorbing impurity, as in Leviticus 14, I mean 4. The trepidation of the high priest feels when entering the uh, the holy place, the holy holies on Yom Kippur, is not because of the very uh, virulent impurity that has been implanted there, but on the contrary, because the violent holiness on the ark. Indeed, not only does the high priest affect the removal of all the sanctuary's impurities, he is also transferring them together with Israel's sin onto the head of a live goat on Yom Kippur by means of a hand-leaning ritual, yet he emerges unscathed. So therefore, now we know the reason why they needed to eat some of the offerings, on the regular offerings, but on Yom Kippur, no one could eat anything. Now, after the Day of Atonement, uh, Kyle, please help me out if you if I'm correct here. Accountability is important. See what I'm doing? There's somebody here who studies the temple with Joe who understands the sacrifices, and I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. If I'm wrong in something, I'll fix it. So if you're still around, go ahead and comment here on the on the chat. Okay. Okay, so now we understand this thing, right? So now we know that eating the offering represents you know, exchanging the priests. Okay, they're they're eating the offering. It changes like the the transgression of the person, a, and the eating is absorbing the impurity. That's very interesting to me. Now I'm going to show you more evidence on this. Okay, watch this. The evidence. The evidence of the that the main purpose of God sending His Son is to bring the message of victory over death. Remember that absorbing and eating the, uh, the, the offering was actually representing victory over impurity, victory over death, because the priests represent life. Maybe this is why the Bible says we are a nation of priests, not to usurp the office of the priesthood in, in the Levitical system or the, uh, the, whole, the sons of Aaron, but to send the message that now us, when we have Passover and we eating of the meal, we are celebrating that God has defeated death forever through the resurrection of Yeshua. Thus, we are now eating something. And when we intercede on behalf of the nations, we are given a witness that is the God of Israel who has defeated death. Acts chapter 2, verse 22 says, Israelite men, listen uh, to these words, Yeshua the Nazarene, and men attested to God, attested to you by God with deeds and of power and wonders and signs uh, that God did through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know this man, delivered up by the determined plan and foreknowledge of God, you executed by nailing on the cross through the law of lawless men. God raised him up, having brought, having brought to an end the pains of death, because it was not possible to for him to be held by it. 
Peter told us on the day of Pentecost the reason why the resurrection was so important. He never said the offerings of the temple were not efficient. It was definitely efficient for the, whatever impurities were caused the temple uh, to be defiled. But the whole earth was defiled by the transgression from Adam in the garden that affected Jews and Gentiles alike. And Peter is letting everybody know the main purpose of Yeshua's coming was to restore humanity to the realm of life by re removing them from the realm of death. How do you get out of the realm of death? Very simple. If you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is your master and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now you are now letting everybody know through a witness that the only one who has dominion over life and death is the God of Israel and no one else. Verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out this that you have seen and hear. Hebrews chapter 2. Listen to this. It's all about death. God come to send his son to destroy death forever, which is prophesied in Isaiah 25, 8. It says, let me go to the verse right here. You, subject, you subjected all things under his feet. For in subjecting all things, he left nothing that was not subject to him. For now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we see Yeshua for a short time made lower than the angels because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, so that apart from God, he may taste death on behalf of everyone. Let me, now let me jump for the sake of time. Please keep reading it yourself. And verse 14 says, Therefore, since the children share in blood and flesh, he also in like manner shared in the same things, in order that through death he could destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. And could set free these who through fear of death were subject to slavery throughout all their lives. That's why Paul is using in Romans, we are slave to sin. Sin, in the context of Paul, in Romans, is death. Life, and the Torah, brings life. And the gift of God is salvation. Only God can render that particular um, pardon in, in uh, dealing with life. Because the temple was not designed for that. Okay? Are you with me, guys? This is making sense. Are you with me? Okay. Now, let's go back to the notes. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. But now has been disclosed that by the, spirit, by the appearing of our Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, who has abolished death and brought to light life, and immortality through the gospel. Interesting. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 28 says this. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep, those who died. For since through a man came death, and through a man came resurrection of the dead. For just, just as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive. But each is his own group. Messiah, the first fruits, then those who are Messiahs as is coming. Then the end, when he hangs over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for it is necessary for him to reign until he has put all the enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death, for he has subjected all things under his feet. And when, when it says all things are subjected, it is clear that the one who subjected all things to him is not included. But whatever all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him in order that God may be all in all. You need to explain that verse to me. The whole premise is defeating death. What verse is this about? It's Isaiah chapter 28. Sorry, 25, 8. Isaiah. 25, 8. And this is where the eating comes into play. Watch. I'm going to show you a few things here that are very, very important. Isaiah 25, 8. Remember what we were talking about eating? He will destroy death forever. And the Lord Adonai will wipe off the tears from all faces. And he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. 
You know what the word there, destroy is? Engulf. Let's look it up in the Hebrew. Is the word to en swallow, engulf, destroy. To destroy, destroying, devour, swallowed up. Swallowed, engulf, devour. Interesting. Let me give you a little history about the book of Exodus. What happened when Moses went to the Israelites? He threw the staff, and then it turned into a snake. He grabbed the snake, and the people say, hey, you are the messenger. But when they went to Pharaoh, he threw the staff. It didn't turn into a snake. It turned into Taninim, the devourer, the crocodile, because that was the god of the Egyptians as the devourer. And it swallowed them, and it represented death. Therefore, the staff, the authority of God, through the messenger Moses, defeated death right in front of Pharaoh, right before everything started. The, the war was over. Let me continue now. When we go back to the text here, and we are looking at, give me a second. Okay, so now we talked about eating. Let me take this part. Why did you eat? Why did you not eat the sin offering on the sanctuary? Why do they have to eat it? Why is it a, 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 a particular animal? The goat or the animal here? Is this making sense? I pray that it is because it's very significant. Many things right now have made sense. I believe in Yeshua more today than I did yesterday. And I believe in him a lot yesterday. Because now I understand that the temple service can be fully functional and it will not do anything away with the work of Yeshua. It's only those who do not study the temple service and the offerings and how they work that don't quite understand what the blood represents and why they needed to eat it. So watch this. Why eating in the, in the land of Egypt? Why was it the lamb or the goat so significant for Passover? And they have to eat it. They had to eat it. The whole premise of coming out of Egypt was two things. To put the blood on the or uh, on the doorpost, because the blood represents life. And it was actually the blood when the uh, uh when the death when the angel of death came by, saw the blood and passed over. It did not touch the people in the house because the house became sacred space. That's why Israel was made a nation of priests. The reason was because they were partaking of an offering. And the offering itself at that moment represented something. Let me tell you what it represented. It was actually the god of the Egyptians, one of the original gods, Kanum. Kanum, ancient Egyptian god of fertility, associated with water and with procreation. Kanum was worshipped from the first dynasty into the early century common era, early centuries in the common era. He was represented as a ram with horizontal twisting horns or as a man with a ram's head. Kanum was believed to have created humankind from clay. He was the Egyptian version of the potter. And the book of Jeremiah tells you that God is the potter. He is the one who creates you. That is a com complete contrast, what God is saying in the book of Jeremiah, to what the Egyptians believed. That is the word Kanum, who was connected with the, uh, with the flood of the Nile. Thus, when the flood of the Nile uh, brought the silt, and cre uh, uh, what made everything prosperous and you know agri uh, in agriculture, it was considered the savior because you provide water, you provide food, and then Happy or Osiris. They were all connected with this because Happy was the god of the Nile River, right? You see what I'm saying? The divine river. And the divine river was considered the gateway to the underworld. It was connected with death. So now Kanum was worshipped as the original creator was believed to have created humankind from clay, like a potter. This scene with him is using a potter's wheel right here. I hope you can see it. He's sitting over here. Was depicted in later times. The, God, uh, the God's first main cult center was uh, Herwer, near, I can't pronounce that name, in Middle Egypt, from the New Kingdom, uh, 1539 to 1075 uh, BCE on. However, he was... He was the god of the island of Elephantine near the present day Aswan and was known as the lord of the surrounding first cataract of the Nile River. Okay? Maybe that's why Yeshua says, I'm living waters. Because he's trying to let you know that God has made him a source of salvation. 
of salvation from what? Salvation from what? Let me ask you guys a question. Salvation from what? Make the comment. From death. You're not saved to do away with the Torah. And you're not saved to do away with the way that God allows you to understand how he defeated death, which is the temple. The temple is designed to teach you how God is defeating death so you can approach him. Let me continue. Now, this is interesting. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 says, The lamb you mu uh, for you must be a male without defect in its first year, and you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. Interesting. Now, you see in the middle right here? By the way, these are the seven helpers of, of um, they believe that there were seven, seven uh, horns or seven spirits. The one in the middle. Is the is the uh, canoe head with a uh, with a uh, with the body of a of a of a man? Notice the serpent in the front. They're on a ship. It's all about the the ritual, nightly ritual of Ra, having uh, waging a war on the serpent in the heavenly sea. That's why the sun will come in the morning. It's resurrection. That's why the Christians they do the resurrection of Yeshua, celebrating the sunrise. <laughs> okay. That's syncretism. That's not Passover. The meaning of Passover is something different. Okay, so now, why are they eating the lamb? Why are they eating it? Who was this God? This is the temple of Karnak. It's the body of a lion and the head of a ram. Why did God choose this particular animal to be eaten for their deliverance? Because there was a message, you see. The god Kanum is the god of fertility, water, and procreation. The consort was Satis, uh, Neith, and Menhit. Children, Serket, Anuket, and Heka. Common symbols, potter's wheel, water jar. Major worship places, elephant time, and Esna. The epithets, divine potter. Kanum is my guardian, father of the fathers. He was considered like creator of everything. Go study their myth, and you're going to see what it means. It's going to make a lot more sense when you study their stuff. So when you look into this particular thing, why are they eating the, the a lamb, which was an affront to the Egyptians? And this is the reason, by the way, Kyle made mention to this when I spoke with him this morning. Okay? Please, just wait. It just makes sense. This is all a hot... Guys, the Bible, the Bible is written for us, but not to us. These things have meaning. And God is utilizing what they understood to contrast it. Right? So now watch. Remember, a shepherd is a king. Yeshua says, I'm the good shepherd. But yet, the Pharaoh of Israel was considered a good king. Or uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, Pharaoh of Israel. The Pharaoh of Egypt, or the king of Mesopotamia, or the kings of the other nations, they were shepherds because they were the leaders of the sheep, the people. So these metaphors have different meaning in different roles and different things. Please remember that, okay? But in Egypt, what you have is the children of Israel are told by God, take a lamb or from the goats, slaughter it on your doorpost, your threshold covenant. In some countries like Armenia and some other places, the alt, uh, the uh, the threshold was considered as an altar in certain places, a metaphor for, okay? So they slaughter it and then they put the blood. And let me tell you how I can prove to you that it was for corpse impurity. What did they use to uh, to sprinkle the blood on the lentil and the doorpost? Let's see who knows. What did they use? Okay. What did they hiss up for corpse impurity? So now we have the same ritual for the red heifer. They use hyssop, scarlet yarn, and then also for the uh, for the um, for the purification of the pre uh, of the lepers. Same thing. Corpse impurity, uh, things dealing with death. That's why Moses put his hand on the bosom, came out, leper, put it back, is healed. It's all about taking Israel out of Egypt to deliver them from death. And they went through the body of water, the Red Sea, oh, the Sea of Reeds. Have you ever read the Book of the Dead and what they think about the Sea of Reeds? They believe that beyond the reeds, there was salvation and Eden. That's why they cross the uh, the Sea of Reeds. We get the Red Sea from a translation later on. 
but it's the sea of reeds. So why was it that Moses, when he gave the message to Pharaoh, told him, allow us three days to go worship in the desert? Because they were going to slaughter the very thing they, they worshipped as gods. Specifically, the, the representation to the Egyptians of Kanun, which was the head of a ram or a sheep. Are you with me? Did that make sense? So if that represents the creator of the Egyptian motif, who makes man from clay, who brings salvation, so God is telling Israel, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to slaughter a, a goat or a lamb on the doorpost, put the blood on the doorpost with hyssop, coarse impurity, because you are all dead over here in Egypt. Make sure you eat that lamb or the goat. Make sure you eat it. Because you, by you eating it, you are proclaiming that you are devouring death. And it is the God of Israel who has given you the power to be redeemed by that blood on the doorpost that has saved you as a sign. It's a sign of the saving power of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now we have Yeshua who is proclaimed the Lamb of God. In John chapter 129, on the next day he saw Yeshua coming to him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The sin, the sin of the world. What sin, guys? Now that we understand this, what sin are we talking about here in John chapter 129? Come on now. What sin are we talking about? Death. Thank you. Therefore now, he is. he represents... Yeshua came like you and I, right? It says that in the Bible. Okay, made Lord for the angels for a time to taste death for all of us. That's what I read you in, in the book of, uh, uh, of Hebrews chapter 2. So now he becomes the living lamb. Now remember, a lamb in the temple represented something innocent. I got it. I understand that, but it has many layers of representation. Yeshua took, like it says, the image of the likeness of uh, flesh or the, as man to taste death. So now he goes over and he tells the disciples, uh, by the way, uh, let me see if I can take you there. Let me go to the verse. I, I want to take you to the verse. Hopefully this is making sense, guys. Okay. Where is the, Where are those verses? think is oh it's right here watch this so yeshua in matthew chapter 26 verse 26 to 29 it says this now while they were still eating yeshua took bread and after giving thanks he broke it and giving it to the disciples he said take eat this is my body now i've heard many people actually say that this is actually uh capitalism capitalism or uh, crazy stuff remember Yeshua is using metaphors in order to convey a message. I want to make sure you got that. Please comment if you understood where I'm coming from. Okay. Was Yeshua a literal lamb? No. It's a symbolism of a lamb. Correct? We're normally understanding what lamb is from what it looks like. Innocent, guiltless. But understand that also you have a ram that in the occult, the ram represents death. Okay. Or evil. Now we know. That Yeshua was not evil, clearly. But he came for the purpose. What was the purpose of Yeshua's coming? What was the, what was the purpose of the original Passover lamb? To defeat what? To show that God had the power over what? Come on, guys. Give me some comments. I want to make sure you're with me. Exactly. Now you're with me. Perfect. Now watch. That, let's see if it makes sense now. Now, while they were eating, Yeshua took bread... And after giving thanks, he broke it. And giving it to the disciples, he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Well, clearly there has to have a common uh, definition or something meaningful because it's not legal to eat men's body, human, human flesh. We know that, okay? After, and after taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. Now, he says, drink from it, all of you, right now. 
Got it. He, they were drinking, right? But there's a reason behind it. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sin. Right? Now, Yeshua says, but I tell you, from now on, I will never drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in, uh, in, in, my, in the kingdom of my father. Because if he's going to do the work of the high priest in the heavenly realm, remember this already, they're talking about not being, not to having any drink. But anyway, that's another story. But I want you to notice what the word there here is very important. The word forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. That could confuse people. It can confuse people because there was already forgiveness of, of sins in the Bible. I showed you that earlier. I already showed you in the book of Leviticus. It tells you there was atonement. There was forgiveness. There was a pardon. Yom Kippur was a day of a forgiveness year by year. For which type of offerings? The ones that can remove death or the ones that can remove impurity? That's a question for you. Yom Kippur was what? To release you from the impurities or from death. Yom Kippur on the earth was designed for what? The impurities caused by who? Caused by who? According to the Bible. By the people. Yeshua, he becomes a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. And then God gives us the freedom from what? From impurities or from death? So you see the different functions. The heavenly tabernacle is dealing with one thing the earthly tabernacle could not deal with. The earthly tabernacle is dealing with something that is not designed to deal with what the heavenly tabernacle deals with. Two different things altogether. They're not in opposition to each other. Bringing offerings to the temple will not ever do away with the work of Yeshua. Ever. Because the temple was not designed to give you eternal life. Only God can give you eternal life through resurrection. And the Bible says that everywhere. Okay, so now. In Luke chapter 22, verse 17 to 20. And he took a hand uh, uh, in hand a cup. And after giving, it, uh, giving thanks, he said, take this and share among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of this product, uh, product of the vine until the kingdom of God. And he took the bread, and, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, so this is in remembrance of me. So, what are we supposed to remember? And listen to what it says. And in the same way, the cup, they, uh, after they have eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Because they used to pour out the blood. On the altar, and on Yom Kippur, they used to sprinkle the outer altar, the inner altar, the altar of incense, the veil, and then the Holy of Holies. And the animals that were offered for the blood in the Holy of Holies, those were burned outside the camp. They were not eaten. Only the offerings from the priests that were uh, more of uh, for for I think for the for the um, for the community, they have to eat after. The, uh, the Day of Atonement after the fast. But in regards to the forgiveness of Israel's national sin, only God could do that on those animals were, were done uh, were taken outside the camp. Now, what is the word there, forgiveness? Let me go to Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. No, wait, wait, wait. The prophecy in Isaiah. Let me go to the prophecy. I already read that, right? Devour, remember. Talk about engulfing devouring i'm going to go somewhere with this give me a minute it says so we go to mark chapter 1 verse 4 it talks about john was was there baptizing in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin forgiveness is the word aphesis there it is aphesis what does that word mean because the same thing is found when Yeshua gave them the blood, uh, the wine as a type of the blood. Obviously, it was not real blood. It was wine. It's a representation. That means that him saying, this is my body, is a representation of what? Well, he's the lamb. What is that representing? Okay? What is more important, the lamb or the blood that sanctifies us to come into the, the uh, sacred space in which now death has no authority over us? 
Okay. The word forgiveness. See, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That word there is either pardon or forgiveness. In what context? Forgiveness. It says, is the word afimi, to let go, cancel, remit, leave, forgive. Aphesis is the main word here. A doctor told me that the word aphesis was used in the ancient Greek. You can go look it up on the internet. You see it. It takes you like five seconds on Google. Okay. Aphesis was a legal term used, uh, a medical term used for a remission of a sickness there was no cure for. Is there any cure for death? No cure for death. There's only one vaccine. It's called Yeshua. Now, who gave the vaccine? God. Okay? And you have to accept Yeshua as your master, but you have to believe God raised him from the dead. Okay? Okay. So now, the word there means release, pardon, cancellation, forgiveness, right? In that sense, is what it means, forgiveness. In the secular world, CL, Afimi derives from Apo and Himi, and put in motion, it says, according to uh, Homer, means a voluntary release of a person or thing over which has a legal or actual control. In the secular world, the word afimi or aphesis, it was actually the release, the voluntary release of a person or thing over which one has legal or actual control. In addition to the verb, the noun aphesis, discharge, setting free, is used from, is used from Plato onward. Okay? Okay. Now, in the Greek, in the classical Greek, a uh, afimi with a person object sent to send forth, send away a woman to a divorce. That's why it's using in chapter seven of the book of Romans the metaphor of a divorce. Okay, not that we are literally the bride, because we're not literally the bride. It's a metaphor of Israel as a bride, because it's a covenantal relationship as of marriage. There's some people actually thinking that we are literally a bride and that we're going to actually have intimacy, sexual relationship in the kingdom with Messiah. I've actually heard that. It's kind of crazy. All right. It says, of a woman to divorce, of a meeting dissolve, to let go, leave, dispatch with an impersonal object to lose. Okay. In the figuratively sense, the verb means to let alone, permit, to let pass, neglect, give up. Josephus talks about this. Now, let me read you how it's used in the Old Testament. This is the important part. Okay? You see how I can validate my faith in Yeshua? I'm, I'm doing this on purpose. I think it's important that we actually learn to learn and allow ourselves to validate our faith. Many people are abandoning our faith. Why? Because all we do is argue about crazy stuff. And we need to look into what makes us different, what allows us to come near the Lord. Okay? In the, in the Old Testament, the Septuagint uses afimi in such classical Greek sense as to let go, leave, give up, leave behind, allow, leave over. These are all the references. I'm not going to read them, read them all. Released in the year released. Deuteronomy 15, uh, 2. Ah, that's very important. Because Yeshua quoted this in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's, uh, he has anointed me to bring the good news. To release the brokenhearted. Yeshua told us from the get-go his role, his purpose, and his function. To deliver us from the only thing the Torah cannot deliver us from, which was death. It says, it is it is used seldom, uh, relatively seldom in the sense to forgive. Now, this is important. The word afimi, which aphesis comes from too, is used relatively seldom in the sense to forgive. Where it is, usually renders the Hebrew word nasa to release from guilt or punishment, as in this verse of say. Or salah, to forgive or pardon, as in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20, chapter 5, verse 6, Numbers 14, 19, so on and so forth. Sometimes it stands for, or check this out, sometimes stands for keper, like atonement, to cover, to make atonement, like in Isaiah. The one who forgives is God. Through the act of forgiveness, the relationship between God and man has been disturbed and destroyed by sin. It's reconstru reconstituted. So this is the forgiveness 
that the Bible and the verses that Yeshua was talking about. In the verses that Yeshua, when they have Passover, this is my flesh and this is my blood. It's a symbolism of the freedom because you have now the flesh, him as a type of the lamb. Okay, that has a representation of freedom that was established as a memorial to deliver us from death. And then you have the blood, which is actually what ratifies, what actually brings the covenant to be restored and to be official, to be strong, is the blood. It's the ratification through blood. Okay? Now watch this. Of the 50 or so instances of aphases in the Septuagint, 22 are found in Leviticus 25 and 27. For the Hebrew word Yovel, year of Jubilee, and five times in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1 through 9, for the Hebrew word Samach, released from death in the year of Jubilee. In general, it is more often used of the release of captives and slaves. Let me ask you a question. What does the Bible say we are slaves to? What does the Bible say we are slaves to? Yeah, but sin represents which type of sin? Right? Now it makes sense. It says, watch. In general, it is more used to release of captives and slaves, like in Isaiah 61.1, Jeremiah 34.8. Only once does aphesis appear in the sense of forgiveness. What day do you think that is? Leviticus 26, on the Day of Atonement. It's a pardon. It's a forgiveness. Only God did that on the Day of Atonement. And the person who sent out the goat... For Azazel shall wash his garments, and he shall wash his body in water, and afterward he shall come to the camp. And there is without a Hebrew equivalent used as an interpretation for Azazel. So there to send out the sin of Israel uh, out into the wilderness on the Day of Atonement, and then the blood of the other goat is to ratify the renewal of the covenant that was done annually. So God is going to do something new. What is he going to do? He's going to do a, a he's going to renew a new covenant. He's going to renew the covenant in a new way. How? By allowing his son to bear the guilt. Why? Let me show you. In Israel, and, and, and by the way, in the Bible, and this is the reason why Yeshua now is presented as a high priest. Because in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 28, verse 38. It says this, and it will be on the forehead of Aaron. Talking about the, says, Akadosh la Adonai, holy unto the Lord, the, the, the crown they wear. Why is that crown important? It says, and Aaron will bear the guilt of the holy objects that the Israelites will consecrate for all their holy gifts. And it will be on the forehead continually for acceptance for them before the Lord. It's the reason I finally understand why Yeshua is being presented in the book of Hebrews as a high priest. Obviously not in the line of Aaron, because the Bible says that he's not from the line of Aaron. Because now he is going to bear the guilt, not only of Israel, but humanity. Okay, watch. Leviticus 10, 17 says, Why did you not eat of the sin offerings of the sanctuary site? Because it is most holy thing. And he gave it to you to remove the community's guilt, the community's guilt, to make atonement for them before the Lord. Numbers chapter 18, verse 1. The Lord said to Aaron, you, your sons, and your family with you will bear the guilt of the sanctuary. You and your sons with you will bear the guilt of your priesthood. Meaning that everything that the people will bring, the moment if they did wrong, they bear the guilt. Okay, they are actually getting the responsibility for the well-being of the whole community. When they eat the offering, they have to make sure they follow every requirement, every uh, ritual, the way that it was prescribed, because the offering, it becomes holy when it's, uh, when it's uh, offered in the temple. Now when they eat it, it's representing some of their impurities, and now that's destroyed because of the holiness of the priest. Maybe that's why the Bible says that we are a nation of priests. It doesn't mean that we are a nation of the priests in the order of Melchizedek or even Aaron. It means that we have a purpose and a function. When we eat Pesach as a nation, we are basically showing the world that God has defeated death. 
And when Yeshua says, when you do this, it's on remembrance of me, it's because of his work willingly to do something that no one can do for you. He was willing to be uh, that priest who will bear the guilt on your behalf, who will go into the heavenly tabernacle to then, with his own blood, ratify the covenant once and for all, like the Bible says. Is this making sense? Have anyone ever presented it this way to you guys before? But it's biblical, it's there. I want to say something and I'm not going to. <laughs> All right. So watch this. Let's continue. Pollution. I don't know if I already read this. The ritual pollution, the impurity. Ritual impurity is produced by contact or cons uh, consumption of contaminated things, such as blood. It can be removed only through the ritual acts designed to remove impurity from a person. These acts transform the contaminated person into someone clean. That's why I don't have a problem with the red heifer offering. It's not even an offering. The slaughtering. Because it has a purpose that is not in contradiction with what Yeshua did. The, off the ashes of the red heifer is so that they can purify somebody with corpse impurity so they can do the service. How in the world will you know who the false Messiah will be if the altar is not restored? Then when would you know that Messiah will return if the altar is not defiled? Okay. Okay, next. Let me continue. I'm leaving some things behind. I want to make sure I finish. Avon. What does the word avon mean? Because that's guilt. That's what it says in that text. Avon is iniquity, punishment of sin, transgression. To do wrong or pervert. In the Old Testament, unlike the broad use of chata, which is sin, the term avon Iniquity has predominantly religious uh, religious and ethical function, a function already seen frequently in the early parts of the Pentateuch of the Torah, like in Genesis and those books there. The word occurs 231 times in the Old Testament, and its plural form sometimes serves as a summary word for all sins against God. As in Leviticus 16, 21, 22, which says, And Aaron shall place two hands on the living goat's head, and he shall confess. It's interesting that from the Day of Atonement, what they're using is a goat. And it just so happened that in Egypt, they used to worship a goat god named Kanun that was supposed to be the potter, who was supposed to be the way of their salvation. It was supposed to be the creator. It was supposed to be the one who created man. It was supposed to be the god of fertility. It was supposed to be the god of the underworld. Interesting, right? The word functions as the key terms, as Milgram calls it, in the confession of sins. Here it is the only term repeated in the summation in verse 22. To include, I mean the word avon, to include all the uh, two common terms, sin, chata, and transgression, pesha, and the immediate context according to Milgram. These three Hebrew words being the most common terms for sin often occur together in the same context as a phrase 13 times in the Old Testament, with avon frequently standing before the other two. Seven times you see that. It is not surprising to see that Exodus 34, 7, which says, keeping loyal love with thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Who's the one who forgives iniquity, avon, pesha, and chatat? Who is the only one who does it, according to that text? Come on, guys. Who's the only one who does that? God, right? And by the way, that text is alluding to the golden calf, which was willful rebellion. And that text right there is in the context of Yom Kippur. That was their Yom Kippur. It says, and he does not leave utterly unpunished, punishing the guilt of the fathers on sons and on the sons, sons on third and the fourth generation. The phrase wickedness, rebellion, and sin is used in God's proclamation of his mercy to forgive. While this phrase is intended to signify the totality of sins against God, it also directs our attention to the completeness of God's forgiveness to those who repent. But we needed a high priest who will bear the guilt. Now, the high priest cannot wear the crown or the choshen when he will go into the Holy of Holies. But he will bring the blood. And that blood was to ratify and continue year by year. But if the temple is going to be destroyed, 
Now, guess what? If the temple is going to be destroyed, then Yeshua going into the heavenly tabernacle, like the book of Hebrews says, he did it once and for all. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father, waiting until all his enemies are put under his feet. Do we really believe in Yeshua? We say we believe in Yeshua. Can we really prove our faith in the Messiah? If we were more focused about trying to show how our master Yeshua fulfilled these requirements in order for us to have access to the only gift that is way above and beyond the, the grasp of the Torah, which is salvation, in this case, eternal life. That's what resurrection is for. So when we have Passover this year, it's not about the rituals. That's part. that Those rituals and that order of the service is to retell us a story. To release, to, re, to remind us of what God did in the Exodus and then what Yeshua says to remind ourselves in the future. It is quite interesting that when you look at the traditional Haggadah, if you give me one second, I get it for you. Give me one second. I'm going to find it. The traditional Haggadah. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? This is the Spanish one. This is what we follow. You know why I follow this one? Because it actually is the proper order that we should follow. I don't need to put in Yeshua on every page to see Yeshua in it. I used to do that. And change the order. I didn't know where I was. But what's interesting is that after the meal, we go through all the cups. Then after the meal, something interesting happened. In the margin, right over here in the margins, you read everything. Read the margins. We have the meal. And I'm going to translate what, the meal, what, the, what, <clears throat> what, the, what it says right here. This is right after the third cup. It says, the redemption from Egypt in the past, was the main theme of the first part of the Haggadah that we recite before the meal. Now, after the meal, now, the time and the theme changes. Now, we are now, uh, the, the, the language that we use is basically pointing to the redemption of the Messianic age. We open the door, indicating that we are ready to receive the prophet Eliyahu, who will announce the Messiah, well, we are, that we make supplications to God so that he will turn his, uh, his rage or his wrath away from those who are willing to take the role. And this is what I said, say, su ira, para que vuelva su ira sobre los que estarían dispuestos a asumir el papel de sucesores espirituales del faraón en oprimir a los judíos. In other words, now we say, to, we call in supplication of God in order for those people who are now become like Pharaoh, trying to destroy the people. In this case, death. So when Yeshua says, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me, we are to remember that through Yeshua now, death is defeated. And the whole ritual, how we break the bread in between the three matzah, and then we hide part of it and, and with a pillow, and then we send the children to go get it. That's the whole story in the Gospels about the resurrection. Death is defeated. Yeshua became willingly a, a willing vessel to become now that lamb that to the world represented something different, but to God represented redemption. It was his blood really that brought us into a renewed relationship with the creator so that now we can enter his sacred space, the garden, where death will be no more. Just like Revelation 21 verse 1 through 4 says that after the messianic reign, then the new Jerusalem will come from heaven because, and then God will dwell with us. There will be no more sea. There will be no more chaos. And there will be no more death. And guess which verse they're quoting in, Isaiah, uh, in Revelation 21, 4, Isaiah 25, 8. Now, remember what I told you about eating? Isaiah 25, 8 says, and he will engulf, he will destroy. What does the book of Rome, um, the book of uh, Corinthians tells us. Let me go back to the verses over here so you can see it again. 
there were some verses that I need you to see. Destroy. Avon. I'm taking longer to teach this because it's very important that we cover. Okay. Lucian, I think it's this one. Give me one second. This is the worship of Nike. I got the verses in here somewhere. Give me a second, guys. I just got the verses and there we go. Destroying death, right? Isaiah 25, 8. The word destroy means to swallow. To eat it. God will destroy death forever. The priests were doing, uh, uh, they were eating some of the uh, of the uh, the um, the offerings. Remember, it represented the impurities in the temple, right? And now the impurities represented death. And the priests represented holiness. And eating it was actually an action that represented destruction of death. That's really what it meant. We already saw that earlier. So in Isaiah says that God will destroy death forever. And the Lord God will wipe off the tears from all the faces. Now watch. The word there is bala. Okay. It says swallow. To be swallowed. That is swallowed. It's different things. In the ancient Near East, the root is attested in Arab balia. Belial. It's interesting. Uh, uh, swallow. In the Old Testament, the most prominent term in the uh, uh, in the Hebrew Bible that expresses the concept swallowed up, gulped down, swallowed up. So it's interesting that Jonah was swallowed by the whale. And then Jonah survived the whale when God gave him the power to be spit out in the, uh, the coast of the sea. That's resurrection message, folks. That the God of Israel defeated the whale by bringing Jonah alive. Yeshua gave us, just as a sign of Jonah, so shall be. The sign of the Son of Man. Okay, it says in the uh, in the verbal form has a straightforward literal meaning to swallow up and go down. Let me go down over here real quick. Check this out. It says, uh, as a fish in Jonah 117, you see, it says, and the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. That's why I believe he died. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then he came out of the fish. He defeated death by the power of God. Resurrection. A serpent, Jeremiah 51, 34. Nebuchadnezzar, king of uh, ba uh, Babylon, has devoured me and sucked me dry. He hath made me empty vessel, and he has swallowed me like a sea monster. You see? Sea monster was the serpent, was the um, uh, the dragon, was Leviathan, was Raab, all those things. Now here, the earth, Exodus 15, 12. You stretch out the right hand and the earth swallows them. It's talking about when the, uh, when the Egyptians died in the Sea of Reeds, when the people of Israel crossed through the Sea of Reeds on the other side to the Holy Mountain, and all the Egyptians died, is because God defeated death. He defeated the sea. Some of the objects on the verb being as ear, grain, rod, uh, a rod of Aaron, in Exodus 7, 12 says, And each threw down his staff, and they became snakes, and Aaron's staff swallowed up their, um, uh, their staffs. That's Exodus 7, 12. And when you go to verse 12, it talks about snakes. Became snakes. Listen to, check out the word. It's tanim, sea monster, sea dragon, serpent, crocodile. Okay, that was one of the signs of the destroyer in the uh, um, in their motifs and in their in their whole thing in the whole belief system. Look at the last uh, the last sentence over here. It is clear that Bala, in all of these occurrences, uh, and the ver uh, and people, I, I don't know a lot of these things. I'm not an expert in Hebrew, so please forgive me. Uh, in the p verbal formation functions in a context or threat of threat. And divine judgment, whereas in the uh, cow is, is a wider, more diversified uses, usage. So it's used as divine judgment. So now we know that what happened in Egypt was divine judgment from God to the Egyptians. You're not bored, are you? I'm showing you why I believe in Yeshua. Hopefully it's interesting to you. I'm looking for one in particular. I cannot find it now. It's all the verses in the New Testament that talks about... Ah, here we go. I never finished these. Or did I? 
in uh, Corinthians chapter 15. Let me go here real quick, and I'm going to all the way to the end here. Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to find the same language. Check this out. I'm going to read from verse 15. But I say, by the way, chapter 15 is all about resurrection. Okay, remember that. Now, listen to how the text, how the chapter finishes. And I say this, brothers, that the flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruptibility. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. We will be changed in a moment and in a blink of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed, for it is necessary for this perishable body to be put in corruptibility, for this mortal body to be put into immortality. But whatever the perishable body puts on incorruptibility, and this mortal body immortality, then, watch this, then the same that is written will take place. Death will swallowed up in victory. Where is death? Where all death is your victory, where all death is your sting. Interesting. It's quoting Isaiah 25, 8 in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. What's interesting is the word victory. Check this out. It's the Greek word nikos. That's where the word Nike comes from. That was a Greek god uh, of victory. Okay, Nike. Or Nike. When I went to... Um, to Asia Minor, I was there recently. I was able to to learn a lot. <laughs> okay, and I want to show you something here: the worship of Nike. When you look into the worship, this is in Ephesus, and this is the image of Nike, the god of victory of the Roman Empire. Okay, and I take pictures now when I go to these places because people have arguments about everything. But if I'm in the picture, at least they know I was there. That's the only reason. Because I need to lose like 30 pounds, 40 pounds. Anyway, that's another conversation. <laughs> okay. But it says the word uh, Nike, in this case, Nikos, or where is your victory? Okay. The word in Hebrew can mean Yeshua or Netzach. It's interesting. In the Old Testament, the word Nike in the Old Testament, the word victory is usually translated in some way from the word, word Yeshua, uh, uh, como Yeshua. Okay. It is used much more frequently in modern translations all, uh, than in all the translations, which tend to prefer some variant uh, of the word salvation, implying a more spe specifically religious context. The word netzach is also used to mean victory, although it generally means forever, meaning victory, as it appears in First Chronicles which has been used in Jewish and Christian doxologies. Yours, O Lord, is greatness, power, and glory, and victory, and majesty. Most biblical texts attribute victory to God, often in the context of a, of a battle fought by humans. Okay? Several extended passages and songs celebrated God vict God's victory, like Exodus 15, 1 through 18. Some texts also speak of the Lord's victory in battle against primitive and destructive forces, as in Psalm 98, verse 1 through 3. And by the way, that's about defeating death, folks. Sing to the Lord a new song. He has done wonders. His right hand and his holy arm have secured his victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. And to the eyes of the nations, he has revealed his righteousness. He has remembered his loyal love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. And all the earth, uh, the earth of the earth will have seen salvation of our God. Go back and look it up. It's an enthronement psalm. While the other text echoes the language of such mythical battles between the Lord defeats the earthly enemies. See, warriors and divine warriors. In the New Testament, Paul speaks of death as absorbed in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. He quoted Isaiah 25, 8, which says he has devoured. He has eaten. Okay? Instead of forever. Okay? And then uh, in 1 John says, for, because... Everyone who is fathered by, by God, by God conquers the world. God has given us eternal life in the Son. And this is the victory which has conquered the world, our faith. You see that? So when we follow Pesach, we are actually making a very important proclamation. We are a nation of priests. What did the priests will do? 
they would eat of the impurities and then defeat the, the death through it. That's a symbolism, right? When we have Passover now, it's actually to tell the story that the God of Israel, through Yeshua the Messiah, has defeated death. This is the reason why the priests needed to eat some of the offerings. Now you notice that on Yom Kippur, the high priest will not eat any of them. Because the sin was so great, and the animals were not touched to be eaten. They were burned outside the camp. That's exactly what Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9 says. When you go to Hebrews chapter 13, I'm going to finish with this. I promise you. Okay? What does Hebrews 9, uh, 13, verse 9 through 12 says? Do not be carried away by diverse and strange doctrines, because it is a good thing that from the heart to be strengthened with grace, not with food, uh, from which those who care for them receive no benefit. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside the camp. Guys, this is Yom Kippur language. Anyone who understands the rituals and the language of Yom Kippur can see it in the book of Hebrews. So why do we use the book of Hebrews to do away with the temple service when the temple service was never designed to do away with death, but it was designed to, re to show us how someone in the realm of death can be purified. If you had any contact with anything with death, can be purified to enter the garden or the temple, which is exactly the master plan of God is to send his son so that he become a priest for us, so that he will bear the guilt of the nation, and then he will sprinkle the blood, but not of the animals in this case, but his own blood, to ratify and to perfect us. Perfecting means to actually make consecrate us back to God. It's interesting that the word when Yeshua says, it is finished, not only is that connected with the temple service, but that word, it is finished on the cross, is the same root word as the word perfected found in the book of Hebrews nine times. Because Yeshua came to perfect humanity, consecrate humanity by accepting that God resurrected him. Therefore, now we are now believing that it's God, not Nike, who brings salvation. That is God through his son, Yeshua, making the way to salvation so that now we can enter in incorruptible bodies where death has no longer dominion over us. And this is why I believe in Yeshua. Because everything that I read lines up with everything that we read in the Torah. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share this with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you so much for joining me. Validate everything I say. Go back and look it up. Do me a favor. If this is not something you study, research it first. It's, it's quicker to, it's better to be, be quick to listen and now be quick to disregard. Amen? I'm learning that myself. Shalom to all of you. Bye-bye.